Well, as you can tell, this has been a big week for us here at Cornerstone Christian Church. You saw the video about our Vacation Bible School, what we call VBS. You heard Jack talk about the importance of missions and taking his kids on the uh, missions trip that he'll be on next week. All of these are part of our commitment to invest in the next generation. Uh, we share that conviction with a lot of other people. We feel the necessity of sharing our faith and investing in the next generation. Um, this, is a, this is a common thing when you get to a certain age. In fact, I would almost say that for a lot of people, there is a moment in their lives of, um, of real seriousness, a life-changing moment when you realize that there's a generation below you and that that generation is looking to you for wisdom or maybe even looking to you for survival. When you feel a certain responsibility to those who are coming along after you. Sometimes this happens with couples when they have their first child, but it's, it's, not, it's not limited to just uh, biological parents. It can happen to aunts and uncles. It can happen to coaches and teachers. It can happen to grandparents. It's that, it's that feeling that hits you with, with two profound convictions. One, that there's another generation and that they're looking to you and that you need to step up and you need to help invest in this next generation. That's one conviction. The second conviction is, wow, I don't think I'm up to this. I don't think that I have what it takes to do this. I remember um, this hit me profoundly um, a couple years ago when Sean P. Diddy Combs came out with his album, Last Train to Paris. He has a song on there called Coming Home. And in the song, he says these things. How do I respond if my son stares with a face like my own and says he wants to be like me when he's grown, but I ain't finished growing? That sentiment is shared by so many of us. We see somebody looking to us saying, I want to be like you when I'm grown, and yet we feel like we're not done growing. Well, this sense of urgency to pass the faith on to the next generation has been around for a long, long time. In fact, it, it pervades the book that we're studying now in Deuteronomy. Uh, over and over and over again, and then the passage that we're looking at today, um, Moses not only tells the Jews what he wants them to know, but says, you've got to pass this on to your children. And today he connects it to one of the most famous and important Bible verses uh, in Deuteronomy. Uh, like, for example, look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Um, he, he's about to tell them something really important about the Lord. And he says this, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. That's the, that's the whole setting of the book of Deuteronomy. These are the decrees and laws which God is giving me to tell you before you went to the promised land. And then he says in verse two, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. You can see in there the urgency of passing these truths on to the next generation. Um, but also God's heart. He's saying, I want you to know these commands and I want you to teach them to the next generation, not because I want you to pass some tests, not because I'm holding some uh, punishment over you, but because if you understand my commands, if you understand my will, if you live in step with me, your life will flourish. You will live abundantly. Things will, in general, go much, much better if you know me. And, uh, and so the command to know God, to walk with him, but also to pass that along to the next children is all over Deuteronomy. It even continues as he goes on to share one of the most central statements in all of Judaism and therefore also all of Christianity. Even that statement, which is uh, simple yet deep, is connected to the necessity of passing it along to the next generation. Look what it says in verse 4. So this is Deuteronomy 6, 
verse 4. You might recognize some of these words. It says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. This simple verse, which the Jews called Shema, because the first word is hear, Shema. Shema Israel, Eloheinu, um, uh, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Ehad. Uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, was simple, but it was the foundation of what it meant to be a follower of the Creator God. And so uh, he says, the, and then he says in verse 5, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So he says this really profound truth about who God is. And then he says, impress this on your children. Impress this on your children. Talk about it when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Don't forget it. In fact, write it on your hands and press it on your foreheads, write it on the doorpost of your house. Do all the things you have to do to remember what I'm teaching you. And so those two things are tied together, knowing the truth about God and passing it on to the next generation. First, what is it that he means by this statement? Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What does, he, what does he mean by that? Well, he's saying that the Lord is one means a couple of things. First, it means that there is one Lord, that there's really only one God, that the rest of the world worships many gods, but there is really only one. All these lesser powers are not God. There is one God. And that is the God that we worship, the God who created the heavens and the earth. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's not just the first God of many gods, the way, say, in Greek mythology, Zeus was the first God of many gods, right? He's saying he alone is God. He is unique. By saying the Lord our God, the Lord is one, means that he is unique among all the spiritual forces of the world. He alone is God. It also means that he is consistent with himself, that he is not a God who changes, a God who is capricious, a God that will be one way uh, one year and another God another, uh, another year. He is a God who is true to himself. He is one. He is true to himself. And therefore, if you know this God and know his will, you know all that you need to know. Because our God is one, and if he reveals himself, and he reveals his will, and you grasp it, and you can step, keep in step with this God, then you know all that you need to know about everything. Um, and so the Lord our God is one. He is unique. He is powerful. He alone is God. Now, the Jews would recite this several times a day. A devout Jew might say this in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. It was part of their prayers. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God below your heart, your soul, and your strength. We say it over and over again. And, um, and, and, and that, that sense um, of, of love the Lord your God is, is reminding them that God not only exists and he's not only unique, but he is personal. And our response to God is to love him. And not to just to love him in some kind of rote routine or ceremony, but to love him with our heart and our soul and our strength. For the Jews, the heart was the center, not only of the emotions, but also of the intellect and of the will, the personality. Uh, everything in your mind and your heart was in the heart. That's what they felt. So when they said, love the God, Lord with your heart, it meant, um, you know, with, your, um, with, with, with all of that you are. You know, your personality, your personality type, and your strength, your will. Your soul was your life, your day-to-day -day life. It was the stuff of life. It was like love him with your soul meant love him with all of your life. As you go through life, in the routines of your life, love him. And strength really meant the stuff of life. It means the things that you acquired along the way. So you could almost say love him with all that you are all the time and with all of your stuff. That's kind of what it meant. 
either way, it's pretty clear. He's saying here, love the Lord your God um, with all that you are. That's how you respond to him. Now, I said that Jews, this was the central tenet of their faith. And that is why it's so important that um, after Jesus' resurrection, when the apostle Paul, who was raised as a devout Jew, was so deeply committed to Judaism that he originally uh, persecuted Christians because he thought Jesus was a false messiah and only had a change of heart when he met Jesus face to face on the road with Damascus in a vision, that this Paul who was devoutly Jewish, um, later on when he was writing to a group of Jesus followers in the town of Corinth, wrote these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 in verse 6. It says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. That sounds like a good Jewish statement. He's writing to a group of Greeks and Romans, right? But he says, for us there's one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And then he said, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. That truth fills the New Testament. That these people who knew there is one God said there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. It didn't say there were two gods, uh, God the Father and Jesus. It didn't say that Jesus was something other than God. It says there is one God and there is one Lord. And from that, we come to understand that in Jesus, God himself had come to visit us. That Jesus is God, the Son. And that somehow God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are one, even though they express themselves in three personalities. What this means in a practical sense is that because Jesus is God, his death is sufficient to atone for the sins of the whole world. And because of that, all people all over the world who put their faith in Jesus can become adopted children of God. And because of that, when we become the adopted children of God, God himself, through the form of the Holy Spirit, can now fill our lives. And God can live in us. We as followers of Jesus can live the Jesus life right now because God changes us and he fills us with his Holy Spirit. Now that's key because I said the first thing we want to do is know God, but the second thing is we want to pass it on to our children. And most of us don't feel capable of passing it on to our children. We feel like we're not done growing, you know. And then, you know, when you look back at the Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 passage, 4 and 5, it says that the way you pass this on to your children is not just through formal Bible reading or teaching or sending them to a Christian institution like a church or a school, but you teach your children in all the, all the phases of life. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. In verse chapter uh, uh, 6, verse 7, he says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. In other words, you will be teaching your children about the faith all the time. Whether you like it or not, you're going to be teaching the next generation in all the things that you do. Yes, when you put them to bed at night, but also when you coach them on the field and when you teach them in school, when you break up a fight in the playground, when you uh, just tell your children what's going on with the rest of your family, when you talk about the news, when you go over their homework, when you walk along the road, when you're on vacation, when you're tubing, when you're canoeing, when you're riding waves, all of those things, your life is teaching. And the good news is, is that when we follow Jesus, Jesus' life lives inside of us. And so we can, we can rationally ask Jesus to transform us and to live his life through us so that as we live our lives and love him, our lives will display him to other people. You know, if you love God with your whole life, then your whole life will teach others how to love God. Just think about that. If you love God with your whole life, then your whole life will teach others how to love God. Now that was probably quite a daunting task for the Jews in the ancient world. But for us, 
we have the reality that God's life can live inside of us through Jesus Christ. And so I just want to share with you that here at Cornerstone, we are committed to building a community centered on Jesus Christ, to investing in the next generation and generously serving a world in need. The reason that's important is because we believe in investing in the next generation, but we know that, that not only does investing in the next generation mean that we do things like vacation Bible school and missions trips for our kids and try to teach them, but investing in the ne next generation also means that you and I, as adults, become serious about following Jesus. And not just in formal times and in church services, but following Jesus with every area of our lives. One of the best things we can do to invest in the next generation is to seriously invest our lives in following Christ. Because if we love God with our whole lives, then our whole lives will teach others how to love God. So I just want to leave that with you. I want to encourage you to take some steps to be serious about following Christ and then naturally come alongside of us as we invest in the next generation. Let us help invest in your children and help us as we invest in all these children. As we together invest in the next generation, we invite you to join us both in growing close to Christ and investing in the next generation. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would live your life through us, that uh, we would be serious about loving you with our whole lives and that the next generation, whether they're our kids or other kids or younger kids, would see you in our lives and they might have the blessing of knowing your will and following you. In Jesus' name, amen.